This is episode number 654 with Mike Wimmer. Today I'm joined by Mike Wimmer, the 14-year-old sensation who has already completed a computer science degree, and he did it with a perfect 4.0 grade point average. Uh, so yeah, uh, he's 14, you heard that right. Um, now that he's done with his formal education, the young teenager is focusing his attention on his tech companies and his socially impactful AI projects. Let's jump right into my conversation with Mike so you can hear all about it from him. Mike Wimmer, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. It's awesome to have you here. I've heard so much about you. I can't believe I get to meet you in person. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. It's great to be here. Yeah, where are you calling in from today, Mike? Salisbury, North Carolina, so about an hour north of Charlotte. Nice. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty pleasant winters down there? Yeah, we get, I mean, sometimes we get <laughs> pretty low. It, get, it gets cold. It, but, gets, uh, it gets chillier? Yeah. yeah, it gets chilly. Very, maybe one or two days of snow, but that's, that's about the extent of it. Uh, sounds great. Um, so I know you through Kate Strashny, who's been on the Super Data Science Podcast three times, most recently in episode number 651. That was just a couple of weeks ago. And then we also, uh, through Christina Stathopoulos. So yep. uh, we had a great episode with her, number 603. I got to meet her in person here in New York for filming that episode. And uh, yeah, then actually, you know, had a great rest of the day with her in New York, went out for lunch and then got to meet her husband for dinner on another day. It was it was really fun to get to know her. So you've also met with both of them, Kate and Christina in real life, right? Yes, I have. I actually met with both of them in the same trip to uh, New York City as well. That was mm -hmm. that was great. I mean, of course, we can meet virtually, but meeting in person is not the, it's just a totally different experience. Yeah. There's awesome. much more of a connection, for now, sure. With Christina, because we went to Jacob's Pickles. <laughs> that's where she took me to. <laughs> oh man, yeah, that's exactly what. That's where I went for dinner. Yeah, awesome. best place in New York. Yeah, it was great. Um, nice. So, Mike, uh, in December, you completed your undergraduate degree in computer science at Carolina University, which uh, you know, in and of itself to our listeners who aren't already familiar with you, that might sound that might not sound like the most incredible feat, although, you know, finishing a degree in computer science is great at any age. But Mike, how old are you? 14. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so obviously that's incredible. And so to have attained something like a degree at 14 years old, you obviously put a lot of focused work in and no doubt you have a rare intellectual capacity. But is there anything that you can share with our listeners um, that they can actually implement themselves as to how they could be learning more efficiently? Sure, that's, that's a good question. Um, to be honest, one of the biggest things that I always did in school was making sure I stayed organized, making sure I had everything together because I was taking at many times 10 classes at one semester. So being able to do wow. that, I had to stay organized as to where exactly and what I was doing in every class. And to be honest, I didn't study a whole lot. I, I just <laughs> realized that at an early age, I was a type of learner where it was more of hands-on. And mm -hmm. for example, trying to learn a subject, it's less about learning the theory of it instead of how I can relate to it is, where am I going to use this in life? Where can yeah. I, what can I do with this? And if I get that example, I instantly understand it and have it and can relate it to what I'm doing. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I think I learned the same way. And I like to teach in the same way as well. I, I like to get people hands on as soon as possible. Right, right. Uh, for sure. Cool. Well, so then I know that you have a big interest in AI and we're going to get into that later on in the show. But is was it because of your interest in AI that you studied computer science? Yeah, well, it was interest in technology and AI as a whole, I would say in general. Right. And when I was began teaching myself because I taught myself everything I know as far as technology, yeah, I love being able to delve into many different aspects of technology for one day I could build an AI system, the next day I can build a mobile app or integrate with right. IoT devices, build a robot, all of these different things that I can learn, and it's endless. Right. So 
with that in mind, that's why I chose a CS degree because I really wanted to ensure that I could, you know, instead of having to make the, the hard decision of focusing on one specific area, I could still remain where I can go delve back into each of those areas. Nice. That makes a lot of sense to me. You don't, with that kind of approach, so say if you'd done a data science degree instead, it's like a counterpoint, then you're really focusing in on AI models, data cleaning, that kind of thing, but you're not developing the kind of broader skill set that a computer science degree gives you where you can actually be bringing your applications to life. Like right. you said, like IoT applications or mobile applications or browser-based applications or whatever, right. that kind of thing you do learn to do in a computer science degree. So in a way, it allows you to dip your toe into the water of AI a bit during the degree, but simultaneously have a way of realizing those AI applications in real life. Exactly. And kind of adding to that, I think many people have really called me a great integrator is what they've called me, where I can take skills and knowledge I've gained from different experiences and projects that I've done in my lifetime, you know, from when I'm just playing around for fun for example, and just be able to integrate them together in a way that's never been thought of before. And one way that I always illustrate that to other people is there was actually a surprise article written about me and from a special forces media outlet that called me the real Tony Stark. And of course, I was honored to have this this name. <laughs> and this, that moniker was really has stuck with me because when people ask me, like, how does your mind work? I say, well, if you, when you watch Tony Stark and you see him with all his screens and he's dragging different things together to build Iron Man suits and such, that's how my mind works. I can drag different things from here and here, data science and software engineering and UI UX and graphic design, and bring them together into one unified thing. So that was always an example that I always use to show other mm -hmm. people, this is, how my, this is how my mind works. Cool, yeah, and you've got actually, if people are watching the YouTube version, so most of our listeners are, listening in an audio only format and they're missing out on all of the displays that you've got in behind you. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So are any of those touch screens? <laughs> these are, these are not touch screens. I'm mainly <laughs> a uh, mechanical keyboard and mouse, but uh, maybe touch screen in the future. Maybe that's, that's the next yeah, step. No, no doubt it's coming. You'll just be like grabbing different software libraries, different functions and just Dragon. dragging them by hand and slamming them together. Uh, that sounds like maybe AR. Maybe we can do that in AR. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. Um, so yeah, so what initially sparked your interest in AI in the first place? Is that kind of something that kind of as long as you can remember, you've been fascinated by it, or were there particular events that inspired your interest in it? You know, I think there was one particular event that I can think of that really sparked my interest in AI. And we were, I, I was with my parents going down the road in the back seat, and I was, we're driving down the interstate, and we pull up beside this Tesla on the interstate. And the Tesla was an autopilot. And I was just completely mesmerized by the fact that it didn't hit the car in front of it. It did the car behind, it didn't just stop in the middle of the road. It was driving perfectly in the middle of the two lines. And even the coolest part was the guy with, that was driving was completely out cold asleep. So that was like, oh my goodness. that was one of the coolest things I saw. How does it, how does it do that? Well, how does it not hit that car in front of it? And that, that's something that sparked my interest in AI as to see how did that thing work? And immediately when I got home, I began trying to research, well, trying to answer those questions. How does this thing work? And in doing so, I said, like exactly going back to being hands on, I said, the best way to learn how this thing works is to build one yourself. So I took an RC Corvette and I had gutted it out, put computer chips in it, ultrasonic sensors on the front and the sides and the back. And I had basically made it work where it would avoid obstacles. It would drive between two walls like lane keep I had just seen with the Tesla. And it would drive right smack dab in the middle, just like the Tesla did. Uh, and that was something wow. I was like, hey, I built something just like that Tesla. <laughs> so and, you're not old enough to drive. And so you were like, well, I'm just going to make a car that can drive me around <laughs> anyway. Exactly. So the after that, I said, well, well, then if it drives in, the, this is an interstate. What if it drives down street roads? How does it know a stop sign? How does it know a traffic light? How does it mm -hmm. understand those things? So that's where I went into the object detection and neural network stage of AI 
And that's where I developed, continuing with my car guy theme, uh, I, I developed an object detection system for my Hot Wheels cars just for fun. <laughs> and that was where every car was red. I was wearing a red shirt, all just to try to basically confuse the model as much as I could. Mm-hmm. And after posting that video on LinkedIn, it went viral. And there were thousands of co- people commenting about how well it worked and the added complexities of things. And from then on, I really knew I wanted to delve deeper into AI and keep being on the cutting edge of it. And to be honest, you know, I posted this stuff on LinkedIn as far as that goes. I wasn't expecting it to go viral. I was just nine years old having something fun to do on Saturday and said, hey, this is cool. Why don't I post it? I mean, that, that was just all it was. Uh, but it, it was a it was a fun experience to do for a younger me. But uh, uh, since then, it sparked my interest in AI and want to keep moving forward and seeing what the next generation of it is. Super cool. So you obviously had that early interest about five years ago and things like, I guess, convolutional neural networks at the time were probably what you're using for that object recognition. Are there any particular AI applications that captivate you today? In particular, I still think the AI applications, I think one of the biggest right now is still that I keep going back to that autonomous car Tesla thing, if Mm -hmm. you will. That's one, that's one of my biggest, Every sci-fi movie, every sci-fi book, everything that you see, it's all about, oh, well, the car drives itself, the, the car does this or that. I want to get to that. Sure, the Tesla is extremely close to that, but I want to get to where, even as far as the lawmaking side of it, where right. we have the car not having, you don't have to even be attentive. We want to make sure we can get to that point and everyone's safe and hopefully just make the world safer. And it's Things like that, that impact people and help people. That's the examples that I like to go back to. Nice. And so I learned just before we started recording that you actually have a really exciting project. I do. That you might want to tell us about on air, reveal it for the first time here on the Super Data Science Podcast. Absolutely. So I am excited, uh, of course, to be working on a environmental reef conservation project that's focused all around the invasive lionfish. So lionfish were native originally in the Pacific Ocean, and they were brought into the Atlantic Ocean in the 1980s, like exotic pets in aquariums and such. And like some other species, lionfish have got into the local waters, and they spread anywhere from Brazil down up to Canada and even over into the Mediterranean. So this is becoming a huge issue because these lionfish have no natural predators over here, unlike in the Pacific, and they're eating the small reef fish at super fast rate before they even reach maturity. And they're eating by the lionfish, the reefs are dying, and they're moving elsewhere. The other issue with this is they don't bite a line, and they very, very seldom go into a fishing pot. So the only main <laughs> way to capture them is to spear them. And divers oh, wow. go down you know, of course, only 130 feet to be able to spear them. The issue is lionfish haven't been seen anywhere from 130 feet to thousands of feet down. Wow. One of the very few fish that can do that. So most of their environment is, you, we can't dive that far. So teaming up with a team in Bermuda, I, who has a ROV or remotely operated vehicle, has began to spear the lionfish using the vehicle and capture them. And a pilot drives the ROV from a boat and being able to go much farther than divers can do. The issue with this is that the ROV can spear and hold lots of lionfish, and it's great to use, but it's extremely difficult to drive because you have currents, you have different, the ocean is very, very big challenge as far as driving something. It's not like right. drone you can't just fly grab there. something and pull, or <laughs> no friction like, on the ground, yeah, um, floating around. Exactly. So in order to be able to scale this where that pilot they're using has had hundreds and hundreds of hours driving this thing. And so if we're going to be able to have multiple pilots and fisheries being able to buy this and use it, they're not going to have that training. So to scale this, I'm currently working on to bring AI and data into it to improve these challenges. And in the middle of developing a bespoke system for detecting and targeting lionfish, which I named Alfred, which is autonomous lionfish, real-time edge detection and depopulation. <laughs> I have to, na- I have to name it, right? 10 out of 10 for that name. Great work. 
Thank you. <laughs> um, and using the high res images from the camera, I can scan the ocean floor and identify lionfish with over 99% accuracy with a neural network that I had built and trained. And it's going to greatly reduce the chances of even missing a lionfish because they have this way of just hiding in plain sight where they would just sit there at the bottom and inside a reef and you can't even see them if you can just pass right over them. So being able to have the AI scan them like that is going to be super easy to, I mean, super, a lot easier for the pilot. And the next thing is, of course, to make the RV easier to drive. So using those same camera feeds and the data sensors aboard the system, Alfred will uh, also actually lock on and drive the ROV within the, the actual ballistic zone of the spear, exactly like a fighter jet. Where when you see a fighter jet lock on, it, it'll drive the, that's exactly the way this exact, it's the same thing. It's exactly the way it works, wow. except a spear instead of a missile. And cool. So, so the spear like flies out of the vehicle and it's got like a string on it so you can like retract it or something? It's actually, it's not a track system. So it, it's, yeah. it's a, almost like a catapult type system is uh, how it works. So it doesn't yeah. exact fly completely out of the vehicle. It still remains in there. Uh, it can be refired every 10 seconds is how that works. Cool. So you can fire right. it, bring it back in because not only are these fish harmful to the ocean, but they're also a great food source. Mm -hmm. So being able to harvest them because, you know, normal restaurants and such can't keep getting them. It's a more of a special type deal. So being able to keep it as a, you know, continuous food source as well. So there's, it's performed great in all testing to date so far. And I'm looking forward to the actual deep water testing coming in the next few months. That's really exciting, Mike. I'm looking forward to actually using data on the robot to be able to understand like the habits and the behaviors of lionfish and where where do we see more lionfish at during these particular times and such and also maybe even start mapping the ocean floor using slam and gathering data as far as that goes to see stuff like that so it's there's a lot coming down the road with it i'm super excited about it uh, so how does an opportunity like this come up you know if you were at a university or something you know i could see like somebody reaching out to you or like, how does that, so people just kind of know who you are and they say, Hey, I've got this big lionfish problem, real Tony Stark. We need your help on this problem. Uh, the world is in danger. Or it was this like an idea that came out of your own. You were like, you read about an invasive lionfish species and you're like, there's gotta be a solution. We can use AI here. Actually, it's, Really, from podcast listeners, really, that's where I get a lot of my, a lot of my uh, contacts is through that. There was the the company in Bermuda; they were listening to podcasts, and I was on there, and they said, "Well, maybe he can help us with the the, the lionfish problem." And they contacted me, and it's it's you know they were like, "Well, it's it's going to be a long shot, but he might respond." And it was I, and then when I responded, they were like, "Whoa, you actually responded to me! Wow!" <laughs> it, it, was, it was one of the you know, for me, being able to, I've gotten, you know, requests from many people daily about, hey, can you work on this or can you work on this? Mm -hmm. And I really pick the ones that I think is going to be most impactful to the world because I don't have unlimited time. Nobody does. So yeah. being able to have something that can impact the world in the biggest way is, is what I want to work on. And this is what I feel can be one of those projects. It sounds great. I'm so glad that you're not like working on financial market engineering or getting people to like click on ads more. <laughs> uh, this is, yeah, this is a really great use awesome. of your, uh, yeah, your tremendous uh, capacity, your ability to, uh, uh, to integrate uh, like no other. Um, awesome, Mike. So in addition to that really exciting project with the Lionfish, you also have two companies that you founded. So there's Next Era Innovations and Reflect Social. So what are these two companies and how are data or AI involved in them, if at all? Absolutely. So Next Era Innovations is my first company that I actually founded at age seven. And I originally began with Next Era Innovations doing uh, robotic applications for the Now robot. And NextEra also acts as my, I call it my parent company for everything that I do. All of my private and military work all go through NextEra Innovations. 
And every idea that I have spins off from Next Era. So if I come with a new idea, it'll originally remain in Next Era and spin off if it actually goes somewhere. So I think the first one of those spinoffs is Reflect Social. And Reflect Social is a software as a service that's focused on integrating consumer IoT devices together into one easy to use app. And this way, users that don't don't have to have those 15 different apps or 15 different devices, and they could just use one app that does everything. And Reflect also integrates those devices together in order to build things that within diff different constraints of the device ecosystem. For example, we have Apple and Google and Samsung, and they don't talk to each other. Well, I'm the translator. I, t I, I speak all the different languages. I talk <laughs> to them all. And one example of this, that uh, of Reflect that I talk about a lot is the, in our household, it's, we took our video doorbell and I built an AI facial recognition system to detect our family members that would come in and it automatically scans their face and then unlocks the door with a smart door lock. It's, it's a, many people, it's, it's just two devices and an AI system, but no one's ever really done it before. And it's those simple things that you can connect together is that makes his life easier. And as far as data goes with Reflect, there is a ton of data that Reflect uses and utilizes every day. From there's thousand different devices, and they all have different data streams and how they talk differently. And one of the example of a data thing that I use in our home is we have a fountain, and when the wind blows at a certain speed, the water blows out of the fountain and the pump burns up, and then that's like a five hundred dollar <laughs> pump. So. In order to solve this, I says we can use the wind data and being able to keep continually gather the wind data. It's above a certain speed that a user can set. It cuts off the pump and keeps checking. Or if it starts raining, it cuts off the pump. Just general, simple things that simplify the lives of they, everybody. Or even like our outdoor lighting system. We have a timer. Every time the power goes off, it it the timer goes off it's completely the timing is way off or say over time sunrise and sunset changes and it comes on at the completely wrong times so in order to fix that i also use another just simple smart plug and use a sunrise and sunset data to say for example 15 minutes before sunset have the lights come on and then come back off just simple things that make life easier Makes a lot of sense. So Reflect Social, a lot of the projects that roll up into Reflect Social involve passing data through different systems. They might even be different, uh, completely different operating systems like the Apple iOS and the Google Android system. And so you figure out ways of integrating different components together to solve new problems that haven't been solved before. Exactly. And to be honest, I will say the launch of Reflect Social has been delayed a few times. One of which, or many of which, was for the high interest in acquisition, although the, the buyer's intent was to shelve it. And that didn't really <laughs> coincide with my desire to, to help people. Yeah. I, of course, since rejected that offer because if I want to build things we put on the shelf, I might as well go build a Lego. So instead of doing that, I will uh, <laughs> just, conti just continue with uh, doing Reflect Social. And since it's beta test, I'm now actually currently working on to revamp the interface and make it codeless and easier to use because I want to make sure I impact the most people possible. Mm -hmm. And as far as easy to use, I always say, if my grandmother can use it, everybody can use it. So that's my metric I always use. <laughs> try to make sure that everybody can use it. Nice. Uh, I, you're really good at uh, spinning out the analogies and uh, you've got really humorous ways of, of making points. I love it, Mike. Um, nice. So. What are some kinds of software tools? So you just talked about all, all of these Reflect Social projects. We have a great sense of the kind of work that you do. What kinds of software tools do you use regularly? Like, you know, what are your favorite programming languages or, you know, sure. these kinds of questions? Yeah. And currently I use Linux as my main development operating system. That's kind of mm -hmm. what's what I've been using mainly. And then... Python is my main programming language right now. I know many other languages, C++, C, Java, JavaScript, Swift, HTML, CSS, R, and many others. 
but I always really come back to Python because of that versatility and that ability right. to do anything. You can build a game one minute, the next day you can build an AI system all in the same language. You don't have to learn something different. Not that I'm not yeah, learning. Yeah. I just like, you know, same, same system, right? Yeah, it's interesting. Python is often described as like a glue programming language. Yes. yes. And so that kind of in an intuitive way, it makes a lot of sense to me that with all of the kinds of gluing that you're doing with Reflect Social, that yeah, Python seems to be a perfect fit. Of course, I of course I use for the actual mainstream app, uh, Mern stacks and things like that for app development as well. And as far as actual like hardware, I actually just got a big workstation from Lambda with the three dual boot GPUs in it. So I'm yeah, I saw you post that on LinkedIn. That's yeah, pretty cool. That's yeah, that's cool. So three <laughs> three thirty nineties, I believe five hundred gigabytes of RAM. Wow. So that's uh any any AI model I need is gonna be trained on that from now on, I'll say that. <laughs> nice. And then um you uh you mentioned a stack there. You used an acronym there that maybe some of our listeners don't know. So you said the MERN stack. Do you want to tell us about that production stack that you use? Yeah, so it's a MERN stack. It's MongoDB, Node.js, Express, and React. Or React and Express, or the other way, whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, basically, it's a way of developing it responsive web applications to be able to use on any platform and be able to just you know, work with rather, no matter what browser, what platform, it just works in what window sizes, all that good, happy, fun stuff have native databases and back ends and front ends and be able to talk to each other. Yeah, so MongoDB is the database, yep. Node is the back end, React is the flexible front end that works really nicely across all kinds of different exactly. situations. And then the only one there is Express. I don't really know Express very well. What does that do? Yeah, that Express stack? is just like how they talk to each other, more, more or less. It's more of just how they communicate. Um, that's that's basically it. I guess it's just another acronym to put in there to make it four letters. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, they didn't want the Mern without without the E. Nice. All right, that's super cool, Mike. Thanks for telling us about the Mern stack and about the tools that you regularly use. I'm sure our data science listeners will be happy to hear that you're using Python, because uh, <laughs> if that's your choice, uh, then it seems like we're going to have uh, lots of young people continuing to be using Python and all the Python skills we've been developing over the years uh, will, will still be. There is um, one other yeah. tool that I use. I think it's kind of a different tool that many people mm -hmm. would think about. But like I said previously about school, organization is super key. And when mm -hmm. I'm working on you know two different companies, I'm working on military projects, I'm working on this Lionfish project, and many other of my pet projects all at the same time, I got to keep my tasks together. So in order to do that, I actually keep a Trello board of every single project that I work on to keep track of everything that's been completed. What do I got to do next? What do I got to do here or there to make sure I always just stay on track? Nice. That's a great tip, Mike. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And yeah, something that, uh, that I certainly support. I use Trello for managing the projects in my machine learning company, as well as in my personal life. It definitely helps me keep everything uh, on the ball. Awesome. So got a kind of a big open-ended question for you here that I've been excited to ask you. So uh, there are a lot of exciting technological changes that are happening individually at an exponential pace. So data storage is always getting cheaper and cheaper. Compute is getting cheaper and cheaper. Uh, the amount of sensors that we have collecting data are becoming rapidly more abundant all over the world. We have more people and devices interconnected than ever before. So people can share ideas in real time through archive papers and GitHub commits. Uh, and then machines can also be sharing information over the internet. So technology is advancing at a faster pace all of the time. Every year that passes, we've got, I mean, like ChatGPT comes out and then all of a sudden everyone's like, oh my goodness, how can we be integrating functionality like this into our platform? Or what does this mean for other kinds of models that we could be developing now that we've seen that ChatGPT is possible? So with this, with these tailwinds of remarkable technological change happening, what excites you about the future or how technology could evolve 
over the course of your lifetime? Well, that's an awesome question, by the way. Um, <laughs> one thing that I, when I think about the future, one thing I always think about is that I was born in 2008. And the iPhone was released in 2007. Right. So with that in mind, I've never lived a day without an iPhone or Wi-Fi. Those are things that I've always remembered because there's never been a day without it that I've always that I've had. So when we look back 20 years, I think that was one of the most landmark moments of technology was that introduction of the iPhone. It was one of the biggest deals of the time. So to be honest, I don't think it's a specific technology that I'm looking forward to. More in general, what is going to be that next landmark advancement? What's going to be the next thing, the next big thing like the iPhone, where we got it in everybody's hand? Now, what's that next thing? And I'm exci- almost excited that I don't know what it is, but also I'm excited to see, to be able to work towards that and figure out what that is and what everybody's going to want in the future. So nothing specific exactly, just ex- excited to see what it is and if I can work on it. Cool. Well, then let me twist the question a little bit. So maybe instead of like a specific technological advance, what about maybe how you could envision life changing? Like, so maybe like the aggregation of like socially impactful technologies, like what would, you know, there's, um, as you've noticed from, uh, from all of your specific projects, you're constantly noticing things that could be improved, things that could be automated. Mm-hmm. Um, even when it's big scale projects like uh, the lionfish infestation. So, um, yeah, is there some kind of, yeah, maybe not like any one particular technology that you're looking forward to, but just like a way that life could be better for all of us on the planet. Do you like, I assume you're, you have probably have quite an optimistic, a techno optimistic perspective. I think there's there's two main I get, things that I would think about is that robots will in in the future make jobs easier, and that's something that many people are afraid of. Where even like we've seen with Chat GPT, it's oh it's going to take my job. No, it's not. It's going to make it easier because does Chat GPT make mistakes? Yes. A robot's going to make mistakes in the future. Yes. So there always has to be someone. I want. I don't want to say a babysitter. But someone wa- watching over it, if you will, that is a tool. It is not an employee. That's something that I've always thought about is it's a tool that you can use, not an employee that you hire. And another thing is like cognitive robots help the aging populations. It, of course, like those repetitive tasks in, that we've already seen being automated in factories with, with robots and things like that. But one other major thing that I see in the future is where we have IoT devices now where we have you know simple lighting, we have door locks, we have ring cameras, simple things like that. Those will also become robots. We will, you will have, and we already seen a little bit of that with the iRobot Roomba situation, but even more so in a larger scale. You're going to have a robot that does your dishes. You're going to have a robot that cooks your dinner. You're going to have a robot that folds your clothes. These different things, like we have an IoT ecosystem now, will be that mixed in with robots, is what I think, as well as an actual, like an avatar that that talks to your life, where we have some of that now with like your Alexas and Googles, but to any, like I said, to an even more crazier, cooler extent, I guess you can say, where you can have like a Jarvis from Iron Man, going back to that example. It's, It's your personal assistant. It knows who you are. It knows exactly what you want and need. All of those things, that's not, it's more personable, if you will. It, it right. Instead of you talking to, like we do now, we go on our, our light for, you know, let's just say, for example, Philips Hue light, and you go mm-hmm. to the app and you turn it on. Well, instead of doing that, or you, you can use Reflect Social, but anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> instead of doing that, we, you'll have this personal assistant that just controls your entire life, and you'll just say, Hey, I need my, I, I, I want, you know, X, Y, Z to eat today. And it will automatically talk to the food robot and do that. Or it can even monitor based on smartwatches and things, your mood and knows that 
if you come home from work that day and you're frustrated that you want to listen to this music and this lighting and this whatnot, just to, for just making life easier and simpler and automating things that wouldn't always be that. Nice. That's a beautiful vision. And so in that future where we have machines taking on more and more of the labor that we need to be doing, um, and even more and more of the cognitive labor. So, you know, we've automated quite a few kinds of repetitive mechanical tasks and in the future, more and more cognitive tasks will be, will be automated. So I imagine that people will have more time than ever to be kind of doing whatever they want. So they could be, you know, engaging in leisure time, playing cards with their loved ones, playing sports. That all sounds really nice. But I also like this idea of there being more people like you out there that are thinking of other challenges that could be solved. And so do you have any ideas as to how we might be able to encourage people to be more inventive with, you know, today people have, anybody could learn, you know, like the tools that we talked about today, Linux, Python, the Mern stack, Trello, these are free tools that anybody could be learning how to use and making real world applications that make life easier for everyone around them. Right. So, but so few people do it. <laughs> so, you know, is there anything we could be doing? How could we be, how could we be encouraging people to be taking advantage of all of these free educational opportunities and open source tools to also be making a big positive social impact like you? Sure. I think there's one big thing that I always come to mind when I think about getting other people interested in it, when I look at myself, and that is staying out of the box and thinking thinking differently. Like, for example, you know, it's not like this is the only way you can use Python. This is the only way you can use Mer, and This is the only way you can use Linux. There's thousands of different ways to do it. It's more about you might have a different way that's not the textbook way like I do because I've been self-taught. Don't don't get funneled into this is the exact way you do it because if everybody does it the same way, nothing's going to come out of it. So with that in mind, I always make sure I keep myself out of the box. That's why I was self-taught. I do things completely differently than some people do, you know, that have been taught some other ways and self-discoveries and things that I've done. And, you know, I even walked into a, I was doing a presentation at a classroom one time that was for computer science students. I said, I showed some code. I said, now teachers, don't fret when you see this code because I was self-taught. I might do it differently than everyone else does. And it's doing things like that that I think is something to to, to teach to other people. But another thing is do not be afraid of failure because coding and technology is very how do I want to put this? It's going to tell you when you're wrong. Uh, I mean, it, there's there's errors, there's bugs constantly. And I think it's don't be afraid to try and fail because failing is where you learn. Failing is where you, failing is where I come up with all of my greatest ideas is when I fail and come up with something new, come up with a different way to do things. That's something that I think needs to be, when people start getting into technology, they're going to get discouraged. Oh, my code doesn't run right. I can't do it correctly. No, it's it's more, you haven't learned it yet, is what I say. It's not that you can't do it, you haven't learned it. So that's that's some key things that I think is is key as far as that is, and getting people interested in technology. But it's also, as far as that goes, you know, people also you shouldn't be shoved into technology. If you have a desire to go into technology, do it. Right. But you shouldn't be, because if you're shoved into doing it, then you're going to be, you're not going to do it well. That's just like if people say you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a lawyer, they're not going to be happy with their job. So that's something that I always keep as far as, especially, you know, referring to parents and things like my parents did. They didn't push me to say, no, you're going to be this tech CEO or whatever. They said it was more of, whatever you want to be. And they gave me the resource to be able to do that. And that's something that I think is important. You know, let a child or even adult in that, in that sense, be able to do what they want to do. I mean, I would, 
to be honest, that's just what I want to do. I would come home from school and use, took over my dad's desk and put my computer beside of his and be able to sit there and stream videos on on his computer and try to do the same thing on mine. And that's what I wanted to do. But some it's just not for everyone sometimes. So that's that's one other key thing I would say. Nice. That was a really wise perspective, Mike. Uh, and I wholeheartedly agree with you. You know, I kind of came from this idea of how can we push people into tech and your, yeah, I, your point about, you know, it's not for everyone, uh, but people who do find it interesting, encourage them, give them the resources. And that includes, you know, the resource of time exactly. to be pursuing their interests. That's a really wise answer. Thanks, Mike. All right. And then, so, uh, this is, <laughs> this isn't a question I ask guests very often and, uh, I don't know why I thought it would be a particularly interesting one to ask you, given that you're only 14 years old, but uh, when you retire, Mike, what are you hoping to be able to look back on? Well, I will say one thing. I'll probably never retire because this is my passion because I've never worked. So I never really started working because I, I, I don't feel like, <laughs> well, I'll say this. I don't feel like I've worked a day in my life with what I've done. Mm -hmm. I love what mm -hmm. I'm doing. So yeah. retiring I may never. I'll always have that next idea, next thing. But when mm -hmm. I legally retire, I guess you can say, I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, my entrepreneurial goal is to build technology that enables people to live better lives. And I hope that in my entrepreneurial endeavors, whether it be what I have going on now or the 50 ideas later, that I'm able to help the better the lives of others and the environment through all these different advances in technology and in general, just hopefully make a difference in the world. And another key thing I think of is that it will take a diverse team to be able to make this noticeable difference in the world. And I welcome anyone with this same mindset to reach out to me and I will make my contacts available and because I want to impact the world as much as possible and see if anybody else would like to as well. Nice. Yeah, that is very generous of you, Mike. So yeah, how should people follow you or reach out to you after the show? So you can contact me on my LinkedIn as well as my website, nextairinnovations.com. Nice. All right. And then uh, I just kind of had the right flow there. Usually my penultimate question is, do you have a book recommendation? But you kind of, you just said, oh yeah, you know, I encourage wow. people to get in touch. So I gave you my ultimate question penultimately. So uh, then my very final one here is, Mike, do you have a book recommendation for us? I do. Here. I have it actually here. I have it for you. <laughs> uh, uh, one of these is the, the Elon Musk book. Um, I've always um, taken it out for inspiration and things just because, to be honest, he's a, he's a big out-of-the-box thinker. And that's one of the reasons that I admire him more than anything. It's not the money. It's not the fame. It's the the out of the box thinking. And these other two here were actually uh, AI books recommended by both of our friends, Christina. Uh, so we got AI 2041 and AI superpowers and love just getting these, giving, getting these different perspectives on what other people think the future of AI is and what we can do to see if we can get to there. Super cool. Yeah. Those AI books will be easy to find that Elon Musk biography there. Who's the author of that? Um, Ashley Vance. To the office. Ashley Vance. Yeah, I think that's the most famous one. Cool. All right, Mike. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy, well-organized day uh, with all of your great socially impactful projects. It's been such an honor to meet you, Mike, and it's been such a great episode. Thank you for coming on, and maybe we can have you on again sometime in the future to let us so we can check in and hear about all the amazing innovations that you've been working on since. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on and all the listeners there, you can follow me wherever you like. Sounds great, Mike. Catch you again soon. Bye. What an inspiring young gentleman Mike is and his ability to communicate confidently and effectively remarkable. I mean, at any age, I had a barrel of laughs filming with him and yeah, I really can't wait to have him on again in the future and hear about all that he's been up to. In this episode, the 14-year-old Phenom filled us in on how he got started with AI by using convolutional neural networks for object recognition, how he's now using AI to detect and spear invasive lionfish with remote-operated vehicles, 
that the MERN software stack for building applications consists of MongoDB, Express, React, and Node. And he shared his vision for an automated future with tons of people inspired to create socially impactful solutions with tech if they are innately interested in doing so, just like Mike himself. All right, that's it for this inspiring episode with Mike Wimmer. Until next time, keep on rocking it out there, folks. And I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon. <laughs>